All right. So the design environment is mind expansion. I mean, that's in honor of David Kirsch. <laughs> um, oh God, this is slow here. Wait, gosh, what am I doing? Has it been transporting? You're changing slides. Yes, we can see the next slides. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so, um, well, let me talk. I mean, the one I will start really frame the whole project uh, very generally in terms of the discipline's role, but even further than that, the, the built environment's role in, in societal processes and human progress, and then to see how the discipline role within the built environment with a, uh, development sits. So the first important thing is to, from the architectural perspective that the built environment is providing order and not just shelter, and that the architectural uh, part um, uh, is, is concerned with order in my belief and the ordering of, of social processes and not with the technical issues involved. And then there's this uh, claim that order is mostly delivered by uh, communicated demarcations rather than by physically enforced boundaries. I mean, both exist. And I would say historical progress aligns with substituting uh, communicated demarcations uh, on thresholds, uh, substituting those for just physically enforced border. So that means we haven't reached the end of progress. <laughs> Um, so in terms of that task of ordering societal uh, processes through, um, let's say, communicating, communicative, um, um, uh, communicative thresholds, we have three, uh, sorry, four task dimensions. And at the same time, also departments, research uh, uh, this, uh, departments in the discipline of architecture and you know, types of expertise. So, I coined this phrase just for, for this lecture, spatiology is number one. I used to call it organization. And then we have, tem so, so we have spatiology, phenomenology, semiology, and dramaturgy. Dramaturgy is relatively new. I used to always talk about you know, organization and articulation, which then separates into phenomenological and semiological articulation. But that's a different way of breaking up similar themes. Um, but, but the new element is dramaturgy and the new phrase is spatiology. I wanted to make sure that it's clear that these are all are, um, uh, let's say, in a sense, sciences as well. And uh, so that's the way I used to uh, talk. Conservative order includes organization and articulation, and the articulation is, is, is phenomenology and semiology. But I think now, I'm, since I'm expanding to talk also in, about virtual environments, interaction environments, not only real, I mean, it's always in there as part of the design discipline's responsibility to have all interfaces of communication uh, uh, as you know, 3D and 2D and so on, but I'm adding the kind of element of dramaturgy uh, to the to the to the list of projects. So you can also say these different task dimensions are different kind of subsidiary projects of the overall architectural project, which need to be distinguished from the engineering project or from the contractors project, where we could have collaborating closely. And our project is most aligned with the end, the final aims and purposes of, of the client, which might be, you know, community or society, you know, uh, uh, private or public clients. So another way I've used the phrase is the societal function of architecture is the ordering of framing, which is more or less the same thing, of communicative interactions. And of course, communicative interaction means cooperations, and that means the prosperity engine. We have societies for the sake of, you know, the productivity gains we, we, we achieve through, through cooperation. And that the, to facilitate that on a very large scale, on a very intricate level of differentiation and complexity and integration, uh, that you need a built environment. And if you sometimes have that, uh, uh, you know, um, let's say thought experiments, you strip out all that ordering uh, matrix, that texts of, you know, of locating and distributing and connecting and uh, let's say um, designating all the actors and, and interaction. I mean, if you strip the city, raise it to a kind of a gray uh, rubber field and throw all the million bodies naked on it. Uh, in California, it still might work you know, in terms of shelter, it, it, it's not a problem. 
but the information is erased and that's why society stops and you wouldn't even know who you are and on what's happening where and what how to continue life so that's what we're focusing on it's kind of an, a a terminologically semiologically but also uh, let's say spatiologically structured interaction process for the sake of prosperity. So these task dimensions, the organizational project now called spatiology project, <laughs> phenomenological project and semiological project. So they have, the, you know, there's a different framing contribution. Let's call it the physical frame or the kind of frame for physical distancing and, 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 and physical walls. And also it's simply what used to be called in traditional architectural field distribution or distributio. And uh, then the phenomenological project and semiological together, they made what was used to be called the dimension of, let's say, ornament. And the bit which was structure and digital theory has gone out of the window, that's now engineering. But so I'm just distinguishing, so the physical frame, the perceptual frame. So we have to worry about, you know, the perceptual tractability of the, uh, let's say, uh, order uh, and organization, which, and, and the offerings. And, but we also need to think about the communicative frame because uh, what we see has meaning, social meaning, which we are socialist into it. So we're looking at the engagement of users, either as physical bodies, as sentient beings or socialist actors, you know, constrained in their movements as active behavior or communicative agents. So that's the bit the way the way this kind of builds up. And that's why I used to always think the semiological project was the most ambitious and integral one and contains the others, the other projects and dimensions as preconditions. Uh, so, you know, a language has to be obviously perceptually tractable before you, we get into kind of processing meanings. And so my analogy for, for that is, for instance, the football field where you have, uh, you have these communicative demarcations around the physical walls, but you're ordering different zones have different interaction protocols, but you also include, uh, you know, the semiology includes also all the fashion systems, you know, the various um, um, uh, role differentiation through our identities and so on. So you have these kind of the different teams with different, uh, you know, uh, dress designs, the referee and the different zones and where the interaction is different. And you can you say that that goes for most, you know, civilized human or even, you know, pre-civilized um, 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 structured uh, social social orders because there's usually there's more a larger number of, of situations and types of people and status groups and roles that you cannot naked bodies are no longer sufficient so you need design you need to start design differentiation to make conspicuous and demarcate and and mark and differentiate uh, graphically and semiologically both bodies as well as surroundings and uh, by the way this whole pro this, I mean, this is my Facebook page. So these are, you know, this this goes for all, um, um, and let's say platforms and spaces of interaction and communication for the sake of collaboration that we have designers differentiating using space and using morphology, color, uh, iconography, it's, it's spatial uh, visual language is, that's the, the key uh, contribution and that facilitates. And we have the, the key challenges also when, when there's a lot of options and opportunities and things to click on and do, then we get into the problem of the phenomenological kind of uh, perceptual tractability, but we also need to develop a meaningful system of symmetrical distinctions. Um, and we also need, of course, this, the spatial logic, you know, what is next to what uh, in terms of quick, quick, quick cursor action. And we have, of course, dramaturgy. Uh, what is happening when I click the windowing opening and so on and then we also get into I show you how we now have an arch kinetic architectures of dramaturgy so um, I, another way to, for me to distinguish this you know let's say uh, the architect's task uh, versus the client task we are form makers and that includes the spatial specialities and it includes these dimensions and the client is is, is is brief supplying the brief and hosting the events and yet that's the content but on the form side of things, we have universal and exclusive competency with respect to all the framing and interfaces. But basically the totality of the phenomenal world is created and designed with respect to its formal and semiological and phenomenological aspects by colleagues. Um, and that now includes, obviously, we no longer have wild spaces as, as we no longer are running around naked. You know, landscape designers, urban designers, interior designers, you know, lighting designers, uh, fashion designers, graphic designers, interaction designers, uh, web designers, uh, product designers. 
And again, we have these dimensions at play. Um, so this is, a, it is a, a discourse of the design disciplines where we, they're the key references. So notion like parametrism is kind of influence and impacting every ph phenomenal event on the world in the 21st century. And that's, uh, uh, it so that there's a kind of discursive uh, um, um, uh, formation which happens. So, um, and what I also want to say in terms of the, the conference that all these four uh, task domains involved consideration of cognitive capacities, uh, particular phonology, but also the other three. And I want to uh, uh, come to that. And I like, I actually have some interesting, I mean, I've looked, I've, I've recently kind of devoured some of David's papers and I find incredibly inspirational and, and pertinent to, think to, to our field and to what I've been seeking a lot of overlap. But I do want to step away and, 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 you know, and share an insight in the, let's say, uh, power of our discipline, of the importance of architecture for uh, thinking for conceptualizing for the origin of conceptual order as such. And I think that's uh, very flattering to architects, but it's also an important reflection of, you know, how we continue to impact, let's say, uh, conceptualizations through, through the spaces we create. So there's an excursus. Uh, um, um, so sort the... Of <laughs> God, I, the, the, the panels are in the way, I can't read my, So that's one of, uh, based on one of David's papers. Um, sorry, the external, how we learn external representations. When I say space, that means all the spatial representations as facilitated, facilitators for, 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 for uh, you know, cognitive um, work. And here's some of the kind of, um, I've, he has eight points, I condensed into six points. What what these the reliance of and you know, what these external structures how they support and facilitate actually my you know, cognitive apparatuses we, we need and work with so internal memory um, saving computational saving uh, create a, a persistent reference this kind of persistency is very important enable the construction of arbitrary complex structures that's the city the city can kind of build up complexity at, Ad infinitum, that's very important, the persistence. So this for me is architecture, your persistence in, you know, you know, arbitrarily complex, shareable to coordinate thought and coordinate interaction. Uh, but also, it, you know, I love that phrase of the inference landscape and I've been always talking about information rich uh, environments, but also this idea of rereading when you externalize suddenly, it's different, it acts differently from mental image. It is, has more, has more fertility and it's, and he shows this research where, where if you have kind of ambiguous figures, which I'm very interested in, you don't have them as a ment in, in, in mental imagery, there isn't an ambiguous figure. You have that externalized stimulation. So, so I find this fascinating. I think he might be frozen a little bit. That's very pregnant space. <laughs> we might find a crash and come back. We may. Maybe, maybe David wants to talk about um, this paper, <laughs> this slide we're looking at. Where we're looking at. Um, I was interested in how we think with external representations and how um, an external representation um, is different than an internal representation because the external representation is outside. You can look at it, you can manipulate it. There's all sorts of things you can do with an external representation, I mean, physically manipulated that, and the operators you can perform on the outside are not the same as the operators you can perform on the inside. For instance, it takes time to do this and there are properties to do this. And so this allows us to exploit physical operations to create transformations which we're allowed to inter we can interpret in every step 
So that is actually like inference. If someone's making a proof, they write them down and then they manipulate them in space to reorder them so they can see what's important. And that allows you to do that in big numbers of, of uh, inferential steps so that by rearranging it in space, you can now see things you couldn't see otherwise. That's different than inside. So there's all these properties that the outside has that the inside doesn't, and the human body and human minds have been designed to live in the world. We no doubt had inferential processes that were essentially connected to the outside. And so uh, though we have advanced in our structures of external representations and sketches and all the things that we have invented, uh, the, the core idea nonetheless is that we manipulate those things and we can see possibilities, we can see inferences, we can see things that are not present, but the mind enables via interpretation of these structures. Standard kind of use of uh, symbols or uh, models or anything like that. Now, uh, Patrick, I think, uh, is very keen to understand how it is that we can shape the external environment to facilitate the processes that are going to require thought or thinking or intelligent operation. He wants to understand how can we shape something so that we improve the social affordances, that we can bias by structure or by semiology, where he showed the lines on the grid uh, in the football field, that's intelligent use of space, but they're externalized. People could have been doing that by convention, but by having them outside, they give us something that is now shared. So we have a shared reference with respect to that line, and now we can coordinate around it. So buildings physically enable coordination. They enforce a certain sort of coordination. They restrict the degrees of freedom we have. But in addition to that, we have all these semiology ideas that we allow us to read a building, to make it intelligible, to make it legible. He's very keen on legibility. So he wants to understand, in designing a large structure, imagine, to use his example, he has to design or the company has to design a floor plate for 10,000 people. Imagine 10,000 people on one floor. And now, how are you going to design for that? How are they not going to have chaos? So you say, oh, well, I'll use the ordinary method. Sure, corridors and everything like that. But that is not in keeping with the modern conception of work relations. So we want people to, as they say, Google gives 20% of their time for their employees not to work on the task they were assigned to do, but to find new tasks by talking to other people, even in, either invent one or work on somebody else's tasks. So how do you facilitate that in a building? How do you decide where to put 250 uh, um, meeting rooms when you have a floor plate that big so people can find their way? When you go to a shopping mall, how do you know where the store is that you're interested in when it's this massive thing? They build massive structures. So how do you know where to go? It's not just a matter of finding your way there. It's a matter of having uh, what we used to, what people have often called um, scent, information scent. How can you detect? where it's going to be. You don't see it yet, but what's the little hint, the cue, the, and, and then how? I mean, architects have a good sense of legibility in advance or intelligibility in advance. So they can see things and know where the bathrooms are going to be and they know where the uh, uh, elevator is going to be far better than ordinary people, but ordinary people have to find those things. So what extra do you add to the environment in a subtle way? So it's not in their face, but it helps them. And it isn't going to, you can do some things on the floor, but come on. And you can do some things on the wall, but again, come on. So how are you going to enhance the legibility of the building? What kind of cues are you going to be using? What kind of physical constraints are you going to be doing to guide people without being in their face? And that is the art in his world of building. Now, his buildings are quite plastic, as he would say. Uh, my students would rather cut off their hand than have to draw a straight line. Not everybody believes that. So, um, uh, and, and so, and if he works on those big buildings, the shopping centers and the airports and these 10,000 people floor plates. And I don't know how that applies 
my bias here, excuse me, Patrick, I know you're not in the room. Uh, in, in the, uh, uh, my bias is that how would you do that to make an intimate room for yourself or a house with your garden or the, some of the more intimate structures that we all love? I don't understand exactly how those principles apply when you haven't got that many people and you're not that concerned with legibility, you're, you're concerned with your, your happiness and your environment. So uh, the, now, of course, their environments have to be happy. But I would say that his orientation is on increasing. Are you back, Patrick? I stop. Can you hear me? We can, and we're happy. Oh, and, oh good. No, I cannot hear you. Yes. Wait. What the fuck is that? It's not... David just did an excellent ah, job summarizing you for you. Well, I don't hear you guys. Uh, can anybody give me feedback? Is there any voice? Yes. Voice, yes. Yes. Okay. yes we can hear you. I don't, I don't hear you. No. Okay. The fewer windows, the better. <laughs> We heard you swear. <laughs> we don't have a blip function, unfortunately. Actually, the real problem is that these windows are all square and Patrick doesn't know how to handle them. <laughs> <laughs> you do have goodwill here, Patrick. It's all right. <laughs> Starting up, we're all eager. Okay, recovery. Hmm. Oh no. Okay. We need some images. I don't get sound, so maybe I didn't click the right thing. We hear you. We hear you, and ah, you're. Ah, now I have you. Now I got you. Yep. Okay. You should Let's go see. past this. I I talked about this. Maybe you'd like to go to the pretty things that you make. <laughs> I didn't mean that in a disparaging way, please. Uh, so, so is that a full image or not? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. I just need to, these panels are in always click, cluttering up my, wait, let's see. Oh, okay, no. Yeah, yeah, I know you know this stuff, but I'm not sure everybody else knows. Anyway, so, so, um, I described this to everybody, so. Oh, right, right, right. And then there's this here, which I've looked at, the intelligent use of space, spatially located creatures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, that spatial arrangements are an integral part of the way we think, and I absolutely agree with that. And um, some of the, uh, the, the facilitations which come through in this way. So, um, so what I'm saying here is, our reasoning capacity, language classifications, logic, conceptual schemata evolved as we were living within co-evolving spatial structures that are also always already functioning as cognitive facilitators. Uh, also, uh, you know, as a selection factor. So, so that's the key thesis here. And um, that has, uh, that left kind of important impacts. So what I'm looking at here, look at in very, very early settlement um, uh, structures and early villages and so on, where where there's you know the, the first kind of severing off of a domain and uh, by by means of a wall and distinguishing a domain and a subdomain etc. And Hegel said you know the wall is the the uh, the, the the kind of operator uh, is it is implies distinction as a very kind of profound um, um, operation in the world. And I think that's a very important insight. So, so we, if it, you know, we're looking at um, uh, this kind of organizing of an enclosure and subdivision and enclosures within enclosures as operate ordering social entities, so the different elements of, of a social uh, order, but also uh, things and activities. But this important thing is that these kind of these become obviously language co-evolves with these 
um, operations, let's say set theoretic operations, and that means uh, logic and uh, uh, is is inherently tied to these and following from these. So, so if you think of early and the sciences and all diagrams of the sciences are, are in a sense transmutations of these architectural spatial orders which emerge in the in the in the life process. So you have the early. It's interesting that you have early these early kind of classification attempts. They actually just kind of just clusters, not nesting yet. But then in zoology, for instance, and then you have these kind of um, uh, starting to build up you know, these nesting hierarchies, conceptual hierarchies. But I, I imagine that if the, that lives off the kind of physical ordering of different plants in an agricultural field or different animals in a, in a husbandry in an, in an agricultural setting. And that and that sorting and separating and putting like to like and and fencing in the fences and cages become kind of the structures when an abstracted by which we classify and and then uh, build build a conceptual schemata in the commas. So I think that's important, and you'll find that uh, in anthropology that the the settlement structure, the spatial structure, is 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 a, is a direct representation of the. Um, Social structure, but it becomes it, this then becomes also a, a model on analogical transfer to all domains of, let's say, um, um, classification and, and domains of knowledge. So and and the way these forms evolve, of course, they're not invented. Though it's not the concept imprinting and the thinking imprinting itself in the world, but the other way around. So it's, it's a material process, a circular enclosure is obviously the, the you know the the economic way to kind of separate something out, and then there's a concentric expansion so you get these kind of concentric structures nesting structures without much thought as a nearly as a primary material process and then they get abstracted and you have to then the ideal city gets abstracted from that evolved city and then that ideal city diagram becomes a diagram for for for, for thinking everything else nearly so that's the thesis here uh, so yeah the ideal city diagram is again based on rationalization of the of the evolved city and then it becomes a cosmology it becomes uh, you know, um, so so that logic is the primary operations of thinking are functions of the wall, distinction, sorting, classifying, exclusion, inclusion, subsumption, these kind of patterns of enclosures, and um, and then you have actually and um, that city model or other kind of uh, caging models become the only nearly apparatus by which we can have overview orders over a certain knowledge domain. So, so the figure of the city becomes the model of any attempt to construct conceptual order. Thinking means to impose a structure of architecture on, you know, on a domain of knowledge. And these, for instance, uh, you have, of course, these in the early, in the beginning of, of a systematic thought in the sciences and the Renaissance, you have enormous amount of diagramming because it's the same time also where architecture brings in the drawing and starts to draw cities and buildings for the first time complete and we're labeling them up. So this becomes, uh, and that, that there, there obviously are these concentric and, and subdivided figures. So this is for instance, the systems of vices versus systems of virtues as very abstract moral philosophy domain becomes uh, becomes structured and mapped by, by the city. Or you have these, and then they expand, become ever larger and enlightenment. You get these kind of, the, the attempt to depict the totality of uh, knowledge uh, and or directly in architectural form like the theater of um, 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 uh, knowledge in a way. So, so that's in the Renaissance very strongly, but at the same time you have obviously the sciences moving with these cabinets and filing systems, you know, there's, there's always the order of subsumption here, um, which, which later on gets abstracted into, into paper filing systems and later on gets, you know, still drives most of our, our digital and uh, ordering uh, um, uh, conditions. So, so and here you have the architectures, like when you directly have, uh, when, when the sciences get these buildings or you get uh, this, for instance, an, an art museum, Durand, the museum, you have, you start with these kind of crystalline structures that, that these buildings also have similar to the symmetrical uh, city structures concentric there's a kind of logic of physical ordering of I mean, symmetry is is more stable uh, it, it is if you know it, it is efficient in construction and then and then it's a kind of 
becomes a matrix in which everything is fitted. So here's sculpture, painting, architecture, and then, well, you wanted four, so the last one is, is a kind of residual. And, uh, but when you look at the philosophy of the enlightenment, look at this in somebody like Kant, the system trying to, system of categories, a system of cognitive faculties, that you, you get these um, symmetrical architectures, there's symmetry and completeness, you know, look at that, there's under each four headings, there is three subheadings, and these kind of, there's an obsession with this. The, the, the concept of order and understanding something is, is, is directly synonymous with, with fitting it into an, into an architectural order of that kind. And still, you know, if you look at any um, science, let's say the overview, the synopsis of the field, of the book, of the, of the knowledge domain has this logic of chapterization of sub chapters and sub chapters and you know, ideally you fit it into these kind of, in, into symmetrical orders and if you look at, at the works of Hegel Kant and Hegel they, the, the, the you know they have they have uh, they have you know the, the, the depth of nesting is kind of four, four, four five six deep and they're, and they're always looking for the symmetry so they, uh, you know they have they have they have, you know, four books and each books they have, you know, sections and within those chapters and with them have, you know, paragraphs. So, so, and there's an interesting um, analogy also between, you know, the structure of a, of a, a like the church as a physical knowledge, knowledge embodiment and, and books. Uh, and, but, but then we can break that out as well. So here's an interesting where, where somebody's trying and, and in a way there's a strange, nearly absurd constraints uh, formalism imposed. Of course, it is cognitively easy, but at the same time, it's alienly imposed on a, on a knowledge domain. Why should the knowledge domain fit into this simple nesting architecture? So you can also then try to, once it was understood, that we, you know, there's an attempt to kind of get out of it and make it more complex and have more complex, um, let's say, textual structures as well. So anyway, so I find it interesting. So the wall is enclosure, establishing a domain. That's the logical operation of collecting, of classifying, of, 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 of generalizing. And then you have this wall of as distinction, as differentiation within that. And I basically, I, I love, you know, it, it, this becomes a basic logic operations. And the, the guy who, uh, you know, Gordon Spencer Brown, the British mathematician uh, in the 60s, he wrote the laws of form. And, was, and he, he, he uh, makes us very explicit this kind of idea of distinction as primary operation and uh, marking a space and the, against the nothing unmarked space. And then you have subdivisions within that. So that's the, the universe comes into being when a space is severed. So that's an architectural operation, literally in my view. And what I've tried to you go back and, um, and, and if you look at, for instance, the Aristotelian logic, which is, uh, you know, a series of syllogisms and, uh, you know, they, and I'll go through them here. There are, there are some kind of form of predicate logic and I think all men are mortal, all Greeks are men, therefore all Greeks are mortal. These there's always a premise, an, an inter two premises and a conclusion, and one mediating term. Uh, you know, so so and and this is the simplest, the primary, the first syllogism is basically simply that nesting operation. And basically you can you can eliminate the middle term and you just have the transitivity of the enclosure relation is the logical syllog the the, the the most fundamental logic operation, the most fundamental inference, so direct mapping. And so I went back and and I looked at all the um, many of the syllogisms and how they how they you know how how they come out. Uh, and they have these, these these interesting names. There's a kind of uh, also a kind of system of these, an ordered system of these syllogisms. Um, um, and no reptiles are sold. All snakes are reptiles. No snakes are first. So where you have uh, uh, working with the, with the, with negation, later on with working with with partial quantification, some uh, versus all or no. Anyway, I've gone through them, and you and you don't uh, detail. It was interesting that in the in the logic operations, you then have actually overlap, which is in the physical mostly excluded. But anyway, you can you can have that you can do that exercise. There's another a concentric one, Barbary, and so on. They have these funny names. That was the logic for several thousand years before. In the late mid to late 19th centuries, you have the kind of some innovation through people like Boole, Boole in algebra, um, um, and Frege and Peirce, 
And it was interesting that set theory is coming out of that. So, you know, so, and again, Venn diagrams and, and set theory as the, as the most fundamental expression of all of mathematics is based on, on these um, um, spatial figures. And also uh, Spencer Gordon Brown was building up a calculus basically as well. He just, instead of making a full enclosure, he makes only, it indicates only with a hook, is, is, re, is rewriting the all of mathematic, uh, mathematical logic, propositional logic in this case, uh, rather than predicate logic on based, based on that one operator. Patrick, uh, making yeah. distinction. Patrick, Patrick yeah. with great, greatest respect because of lost time. Do you think you could proceed a little deeper into your talk to, to have some of the architectural elements that are so magnificent that I know you want Because I saw so many slides. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know, I mean, you could also give me more time. <laughs> yes, but I, you know, we, we will give you a little more time, but, but perhaps <laughs> there's so many slides, so. Okay, okay, great. Okay, I go quickly on this. Uh, so, so just, you know, both Frigg and Kurs, they're working with this formalism to, to rebuild logic. And instead of having these kind of, let's say, string sequences, they have spatial diagrams. And there are two, there are two spatial diagrams, both architectural, the kind of nesting and, 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 and domains, and then the path systems, as it were. And uh, all reason, and then first that this all reason depends directly or indirectly on diagrams. And I, I find that interesting. Okay, so, so, so uh, okay, I'll go through. This is the, the laws of form and the way some philosophers use it actually. And that, so they have these two sets of diagrams, um, um, systems of territories and networks of routes through territories. I call one the paradigmatic and the syntagmatic. And you find it everywhere, you know, every, and the funny thing is most diagrams are just these nested box and box or, 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 or uh, 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 branching diagrams. And they're coming, uh, they're so ubiquitous and it's a very simple and primitive architecture and they're everywhere and also uh, logic circuits based on that. So, and, 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 but the, this point I also want to make is that you can make these, but the, the, the tractability perception is very important. You have these kind of bracket systems. What are brackets if they aren't nesting uh, and sub structures? But if you would drive the circle through, you could directly see what's going on, otherwise than counting and tracking, tracing brackets. So there's a kind of, um, um, a one, a, not a full two way, but the isomorphy between uh, the set domains and the, and the graphs, and you can translate one if from graphs, uh, from, from sets into graphs, the other way, the graphs are sometimes too complex to do something meaningful with, with this. And that has been introduced in architecture a little bit. And uh, there's more, they, they kind of, let's say, I, I discovered this guy, uh, William Brickham, who is doing, uh, trying to do all the kind of formalisms, even 3D volume formalisms, in which he can kind of write his iconic mathematics or iconic logic. Now, what I find interesting in architecture We've gone beyond these simple uh, processes, and we have we have you know, we, we have these kind of intersections more uh, developed. We have we have uh, an, an ambiguity built in. Uh, you know, you can read figures multiple ways, and that becomes an interesting condition. We have instead of these nested figures, and uh, just saying we have these sort of more or less in, uh, in, uh, absorbed within and express as separations. We have fuzzy logic, so we have blurred boundaries. So these are new logic operations and we bring them into architecture. And I think that, that that's very, I think, important that, that we have now a kind of this mind expansion through also architectural spatial research. And we live in these more complex uh, uh, structures with new ontologies like gradients, like interpenetrations, like swarms, where you have overlap and fuzziness uh, but if we that, that we are also getting more used to these more complex ways of thinking, which at the moment we're not. We're kind of it's it's kind of a, a, a disorienting oftentimes. So and what about three D uh, formations like this? So this is our architecture. The world already becomes like this. These kind of swarm formations in in the in the, the build environment, working environment, three D swarm formations, which we imagining, and then using all the elements. Like they, you know, lighting grids become swarms of light elements, swarms of furniture of different categories inter flowing through each other and, and, and layered. So this becomes a world of orientation and it become dynamized as well. So that's the world of architecture where we're moving from the left to the right. And there's a new ontology, a new logic, you know, that harmonizes with, 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 with let's say fuzzy logic, for instance. And so, but it becomes complex, becomes difficult to track that world. So we need to have that loop of phenomenology. So, you know, we have, we, 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 you know, we need to maintain legibility and orientation and, you know, otherwise we're kind of swamped and incapacitated in the, 
in the face of this complexity. That becomes an explicit task. And there's also in the graphic design and, 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 and virtual and virtual uh, spaces a, a challenge. I mean, I never find my, my, my apps. And there's a, you know, and then they're trying, as you see in the last thing, to do a bit of kind of nesting here to structure, but that's not good enough anyway. And we have prob problems as well as this. And so there's, you know, things like, you know, you can kind of sequence out and not offer too many things at the same time, but then you have many sequences to the depth of, of search and choice to navigate. And I don't think that's the answer. It's more the answer of making the larger uh, simultaneous structured field more tractable. So that's where I bring in, you know, the, uh, the Gestalt grouping principles. And I know David is a, is a skeptic. And I will, I will prove you, I mean, I will show you how we, we must kind of group and must be aware of how we actually decompose a complex scene, like that table full of stuff where you don't find your, 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 your pep on your soul and your, and, uh, and so one is, you know, smooth continuation and, and, and so, so what, and, and there's more information embedded if you move to curves and, 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 and blobs. Uh, and in particular, if you love intersection, because here you see A, this little field, it doesn't change. You don't know that it's intersection of several other ones and which ones they are. Uh, but if you uh, if you do it with circles, you you, you contract. That is a special space, the space of generator of intersection. Which one, how large and how, how, how proportioned these things are, you maintain much more information in the system. Um, so, so that is information richness, but it's also as legibility conditions. And then we should have smooth and you have kind of gradient color application as a repertoire. You can also gauge your your you know your your distance to a center or to some other event. So that's just uh, empowering parametricism repertoires are cognitively empowering. They are also semiologically richer uh, and more legibility. So information inference potential, but you also it needs to be cognitively tractable. And if you want to find a path through that. Again, the kind of smooth path is easy. The other one, you, if you look at it, you, you know, to, to, to follow, even though it wasn't by color, by the way, and the other one, you don't know if at each junction where it, where it continues. So these are, let's say, I'd call it the superiority of the curves, the superiority of parameters. So first question of orientation with this navigation, the identification of, the, of path or ways to go, what's coming behind, and recognition that the, what is in front of you actually recognize and identify a place, a situation, and an interaction opportunity wanted to. And just throw in how, you know, if you imagine a park and ride scheme, a parking lot with two separated sites, you have to deal with a tram station and the bus station. Usually it would totally disappear in that clutter of suburban crap. And here it's kind of conspicuous, strong. You can lead it, you can, you can follow it through. Everything is geared towards, you know, let's say uh, the, the, the curvature, all the cars participate. And then you use all the elements become become part of this kind of legible formalism. The way the cuts come, bring in the bus, bring in the uh, you know bring in the tram, and the way you connect up, and the way the elements uh, and uh, the, the, these demarcation lines become the the, the cuts, the 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 the, 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 the lampposts grow and become the columns, and you have this interfacing of structures. So that's the legibility. That's the discourse and power and discourse, and then you have. We want multiple uh, referencing and multiple stories layered into the same space. So this is a series of spaces. There's also a series of walls you can orient along. You can navigate by space, but wall is an overall color gradient as well, by the way. You can use that as navigation, both within the walls and on the background. And so you have a multiple sets of references and all of them as you know, like conspicuous and significant. And then you can and then you kind of sort the elements into various groupings, simultaneous groupings, and you can follow it. And there's interesting games with color uh, and terminology, uh, et cetera. So like this, where you're depending on where you look, what the, the background is, you can make credit difference or sameness. Uh, terminologically, you can kind of have, have terminologically empowered variation, observer dependent, uh, color observer dependent. Uh, figuration. This is a figure which only snaps into place and is visible from one perspective. So all of these are, let's say, you multiply layered uh, uh, conspicuous readings rather than having uh, no reading at all, let's say. And this from different perspectives. This looks, you know, open to the top, open to the bottom. It's the same structure offering different, uh, let's say, vistas and views. And uh, I'm not sure if that animation will come through the thing. Um, it's the same event 
from different perspectives. So you have multiplicity of all addressing multiple audiences, with different agendas, with different orientation requirements. And this is the same way you can have um, a, a differences uh, emerge uh, or differences be obliterated based on the perspective. So whether it's something homogenous or heterogeneous, and what identity it has or doesn't have. Um, and you can turn squares into circles and circles into squares. Oh, let's also show us that when we started to talk about these, uh, these, these the spatial diagrams and, 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 and somebody like Stein is working on this, they actually, you can't pin them down as objective. They're always cognitive, subjective, you know, uh, and, 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 and that makes the thing, the game interesting and more complex. And uh, so, so that's what we're doing. Also, movement is is maybe not real, but induced, but can animate something and make something active if you move. And uh, it also, you know, uh, it, it, it slide and shadow. So we have uh, object parameters, but they actually never deliver anything. You always need to hold in uh, observer parameters and observer co cognition uh, processes, as well as ambient parameters like light and shadow, which can totally switch and shift. Uh, perception what becomes from conspicuous, which becomes foreground, background, etc. So that's the repertoire we're working with. And now all of that we're bringing into the game of semiology. When we develop a, a spatial visual language, we have to keep all of that in mind. These dynamics, these kind of uh, ordering and the spatiology and feminology is now coming in. And we're doing a language which builds up grammar. So we're building up complex meanings for meaning components or sign radicals, like you have actually rudimentarily. Yeah, I don't have in the animal kingdom at all. We don't have much of that in the actual spontaneously evolved semiology in terms of grammar, but we can develop a grammar based spatial language which has a much more power through combinatoric um, and in terms of expressiveness. But so we do actually have in the traffic science system, you can, can we combine the internal with the color of the ring, with the shape, they're all different components. So otherwise you have to, you would have you know a kind of unmanageable array of, 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 of icons and so on, and the categories, but also I'm looking at all these kind of types of words and lines. That's an example. So on the traffic management system, we actually have a design semiology and, and it is structuring the space. And by the way, they're also considering feminology. You have to kind of anamorphically stretch these figures uh, that you can see them when you, when you look obliquely on it and you, you start to have, you have to worry about size and distance and where these things are placed. And so with this, I, you know, I want to show you, we developed a kind of semiological project. You can see it's a parametrism language and it is, it, it, everything means something. So we have the base distinction between unbound open free space, which is a public and social and that's a leisure space versus the business spaces, which are bound. It's two separate convex versus concave, but each of them have multiple variants. They, and you still can track to an infinite number, you know, it's what the concave thing is. But then we can build up grammar the way these kind of nest on combine, the way you can overlap them and generate a, a workspace, of, let's say an amoeba space out of two amoebas or meeting space out of convex space out of two amoebas or uh, et cetera. So there's a kind of grammar, the, the tracking the, 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 the robustness of these distinctions and meanings through combinatoric situations and tractability. And then you carry this from, you know, the overalls, you then introduce a gradient across the whole thing where, that's, where, where these dichotomies evolve into spectri. And then you add kinetics and transformation. And then you, it, it, it applies both on the larger territory scale, also the table shape, the lamp shape, and it kind of becomes fractally embedded as, as redundantly embedded and reused. And that's the way we that generate. And then the next, this was all kind of old parametricism as repertoire, but we have evolved in the meantime to tectonism, much, much richer. So we, we, we generate this on the basis of tectonic principles where we have structural optimization, environmental optimization, fabrication, logic, robotic, location, diversity, all these distinct and that kind of morphology we coming out of that becomes a kind of orchestrated palette to do that project much better than this project, which is becomes actually a little bit more homogenized and, and, and not fully, and fully, fully, if you need more, the, the buildings, as the project being larger, we need a much larger repertoire and it comes out of, let's say, tectonism for me. So that, and you can make these network of similitude and contrast. So you think, you know, everything is both similar and contrasting with within a system of similitude and contrast. 
No, Patrick, uh, I just, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I just want to give you a five minute warning. So we have time for ah, okay, yes, perfect. There you go. Okay, so <laughs> Thank anyway, you, sorry. I like even, you know, some of the kind of said, you know, language is a system of activities of disposition, you know, communication for, for coordination of activities. And there's a pragmatist kind of thrust uh, I absolutely believe in. And that's the next stage where we're saying, okay, we, we implement this we build these languages, but now we're actually showing the meaning. The meaning in the end is only the interaction scenarios, which are distributed uh, in a, across that landscape and all the nuances of distinction um, and, 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 and placement also where, this, where you are and which morphologies, which surroundings, uh, that, will, that will distinguish a complex distinguish, distinction of all these social situations. And the paradigm of that is that, you know, in this case, each territory triggers have a different protocol of interaction, a different do's and don'ts of, you know, and behaviors. And of course, there's different positions, but they should also have different shape, different color. And so, so that's where we're starting. We, and we don't work with physical walls so much, open territories. The premise is degrees of freedom and self-directed uh, uh, roaming and not being shackled and prohibited and, and, and channeled like a kind of cattle in a, in a, ch in a, in a channel, in a, in a maze, but, 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 but an empowering so that these kind of, uh, that, 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 that situations can kind of organize and they, they have a kind of substrate to hook onto to, um, um, to, 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 to have, to give a chance to this kind of self-structuring Operations, they could also be degrees of indeterminacy, the degrees of abstraction and openness in the, in the language. So we're also talking about just use negation, you, 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 you use implication, use, 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 use disjunction, say this is either this or this or this, this or that, or it's just not this and everything else is possible. So it's not going to be highly prescriptive. Because David said, you know, make sure nobody thinks it's a kind of a totalitarian nightmare. This is an empowerment premise on new degrees of freedom where we in the in the in the work environment you know you know we were asked to kind of self-initiate the projects the collaborators uh, uh the, the 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 networks and and but how we do it on an empty rubber field we couldn't so we need to be given something uh, 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 this and and the in the degree of the determinateness of the meaning is, is, is up for grabs. So in any way, these are only offerings, and the meaning evolves in a sense through the pragmatic appropriation and what they become to mean. But if there's a structure, uh, then I think the systems can hook onto this rather than uh, when they when they're thrown into kind of noisy, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 unstructured environment. They can't. So this is again the, the experiment we're making and. Yeah, so so this quickly. These are these are real projects uh, where we are where we are doing this, and we have these three-dimensional fields of interaction with with they, you know, thousands of people on a across several plates, and we having developing these these simulation capacity with thousands of agents which are heterogeneous, are differentiated, but they empower. They know um, they have these. Uh, let's say they, 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 they have their, their, their action repertoires are tied to the different zones and situations. And so that you can order the different, bring them, bring different, let's say complementary uh, uh, actors into one place where, where they kind of primed to, 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 to the situations predefined. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of paralyzing um, misunderstanding about the situation and what, what the do's and don'ts are. And we, we do, we run these, and we are looking for encounter uh, frequencies, but also the conversion of encounters into communication situations and the specificity of this and where to distribute meeting rooms, entrances, uh, desk spaces. And we're kind of tracking that. Um, um, and we're trying to argue and we're trying, we're not, I'll show you later, we're, we're starting to work on also phenomenological tractability and navigability of this as well, uh, uh, which is here or just presumed and intuitively tested. So I'm just finishing. I mean, we have been building these projects. We are, we are running our systems and we do a large projects. We're doing now kind of multi-building urban districts uh, with, with many different functions. They're actually under construction as we keep building. And one of the, our research teams generate this kind of play where we have a navigation task where you, you show somebody for a moment a map uh, uh, an isometric show, throw them randomly and give them a random target and then they have to find their way through that and uh we see what how they how they manage to and the, and, and the, the the target is quite obscured 
but you have landmarks you could go by or you can always follow the what do i see a lot you follow the there's a bifurcation and you roughly have the the, the broad direction you go in the direction of more openness and we're trying to figure out what, what these behavioral logics are each thing and we're kind of mapping who went where and what 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 the what the kind of uh, uh, center of the screen uh, is at each point and what the different runs have been and so on so there's an attempt to have an empirical uh, um, um, uh, Patrick, analysis also. Perhaps yeah, yeah. this is a good place to sort of talk well, about um, the projects because there's a very interesting question that is being um, put on the chat by Julie and others about orientation. So I wondered if we could. Okay, yeah, we can stop here. We can. We can. I mean, the, I had a segment on 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 let's say virtual environments because this, this space we use VR here for this to create. Uh, to to simulate and anticipate our, our you know a, a real spaces, but we're also developing virtual metaverse and so on, where the similar issues are at play. We also want to simulate and guess. Mm -hmm. So let me stop here because my oh. time is up. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> we know we can listen to you for three hours. <laughs> Actually, you need three hours. Um, I thought maybe I would bring uh, ask Julie to ask uh, your question because it's sort of going, um, it's being responded by other people. Julie, would you mind? Julie Zulin Kramer? Yes, hi. Uh, hi. Sorry, I was just trying to, um, you know, get the buttons on. Um, so, Patrick, I had you know, noticed an article that you had written about this concept of parametric versus what I thought you were talking about earlier, which was symmetric. And this, the way you connect it to sort of math and language, I thought very fascinating, started to make a lot of sense to me. And then I immediately started to like, look at some of these, you know, more, I, I'm calling it, cause it's new to me, this term parametric design, um, because I'm an educator, not an architect. And I thought, wow, a lot of sometimes, and a lot of times in spaces that aren't, that are m like, overly fluid or what I would say maybe overly parametric, I find discomforting and I feel a sense of dis-ease. And so that sort of started that. Um, and then I thought, well, I wonder if that's because my brain um, is being asked to do something it's not used to doing or something that Meredith brought up regarding um, the sensory experience of it, which uh, because I have sort of a co-mingling of my visual and um, balance sensory, um, I'm more susceptible to that. Um, so I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the human experience of symmetric versus what I'm thinking are called parametric design. Well, symmetry is one of those um, um, elements which, uh, which allow you to recognize, uh, which become conspicuous in the field of vision. So that's something we can, we can use to draw attention to something special and you can also have a lot, you know, in, but so, 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 but, but to have the, the overall scene that you ordered symmetrically, you, you obviously have a lot of, you know, a symmetry breaking is actually information increase. So, so then you have a problem. You can make something, one spot particularly um, um, uh, conspicuous, maybe the entrance if you build around it symmetrically, but then you have, you have to, you know, you're giving up information and in different in further, in, in further, if there's further things you might want to choose, you can no longer, uh, is, you know, maximize that relatively to an asymmetric. So there's an interesting balance to strike. Um, but I think what what you talk, what I find, I find first of all the experience we made that our um, designs we win a lot of competitions. And my re what I believe is that that looking at these designs is relative is rather comforting because and also when we look at our own designs when we develop this the brief if you have a competition everybody has to deliver the same amount of uh, brief components and they become usually they're getting quite complex if you have a mixed views or a TOD or some kind you know a, a, a central urban hub with many different program components uh, we need to distribute you know you need to di distinguish them yet there is certain unity around that and we found that um, so 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 that that if you have the problem of complexity of many things you want to offer many things which are happening simultaneously and like you, you you know you're going to a big shopping mall or big department store because you want to have that choice and you want to browse there rather than knowing exactly what you want and then you like to go into a little village and buy that but 
if you if you presume that you that you that you need to, in order to function, you need to in, engage that complexity, then these parametric tools are very powerful of maintaining of ordering that complexity and maintaining legibility in the face of complexity because we have more than just symmetry or container and subcontainer or and and uh, we have we have many register and repertoires um, of of of, ma of making connections and have multiple similitude relationships and so on and and having for instance gradients and trajectories and having an overlap intersection where something belongs to several domains, so you can get, get at it from different directions. So in the, so that's why I find this in the in when you are actually challenged and thrown into an environment, and the many not many of these are built. And where you have equal complexity and uh, let's say, uh, which means also um, affordance and empowerment, that the parametrism project and now technology project, I would see you feel much more comfortable because you don't get this menacing disorientation and getting lost in the frustration of running into three, three false directions. But also, if it's too isotropic, if it's too the same everywhere, like a minimalist grid, you don't know where you are, you're getting lost. So it's so that's what I find. And I find um, a, that's why we evolved out of deconstructivism into parametrism because deconstructivism is getting very complex with all these kind of intersecting shames. You get a lot of difference. But Patrick, as, a, Eve as, had as an a interesting... designer, you get lost in your own drawing, and that's the menace. You draw, you go off to the, you go to the toilet, you come back, you don't know where you've been drawing. So if you don't, if you get even lost in your own drawing, then something is wrong. So that's the thing. Uh, I think it's very comforting. <laughs> Um, Eve Edelstein had a response to disorientation yeah. that I thought it could could sort of take the question even further. Eve? Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, I enjoyed your presentation so much from the historical through the theoretical and then to the actual. And I loved your term menacing disorientation. And my experience is that often such designs can, there's a difference between disorientation and desire to explore. And this is the aspect that I see in the work that you described and in the philosophy of that work. Uh, that often happens, although you might not be fully aware of the order or traditional, perhaps linear uh, circulation or understanding of space. Um, certain forms entice you to go there, for example, um, as you have on the screen. If you put a ramp somewhere, uh, children will run up the ramp. Mm -hmm. they they are drawn to it so there's something about these forms that may be disorienting but entices i do have another question in addition um your gaming system is is fascinating and i can see that it's observational and empirical i'd like to know if you have embedded some neuroarchitectural principles in there that you're testing out that we've learned from spatial cognition which i would be delighted uh, along with our colleagues to explore with you because that could test some of the ideas in your end yeah because uh, you're yeah, absolutely right i mean and and i would like to i mean at the moment what we've done we have one one project and uh, we're exploring, um, um, you know, we, it, we, we don't have a comparative setup where we, for instance, have a second design. And so we can, uh, we, we can compare how, 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 whether navigation gets, gets worse or better. For instance, mm -hmm. if we had a minimalist design with a lot of boxes and so on, uh, uh, and, and, and more gridded uniformity and with not, without a kind of gradient and without force fields, which, 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 you know, have a kind of, Concentric conditions. I mean, there's even we 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 would. So we have a set of heuristics where we can say what we believe based on what we understand. And now, of course, we need a lot of help from people like David. That's why I've been invited, inviting him to join this research. Um, uh, it, you know, which 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 pertinent features we can embed to 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 have a good shot that this is a better version. And then we have a testing, uh, a testing setup um, uh, with this test people, and the, the, even the hope to later on make, you know, optimize that. That if we get some principles of 
navigation have, 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 have kind of a navigating agent. But so at the moment we don't have, uh, we're just starting that. And, and uh, we definitely need, uh, I think, theoretical insights mm -hmm. to guide. So we don't start with a random design. We start with the design. I mean, I think I have intuitive and, and, and what I've understood from, from, from um, um, let's say, uh, perception, perception and cognition issues and, and so on. Um, uh, to guide that 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 generation phase, and then we have the test phase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I think there are um, a number of principles from the neuroscience of spatial cognition that could be readily um, merged with your system um, to test whether or not those principles are actually effective in the form presented that would correlate nicely with the guidance. Yeah, exactly. It would, it, would, it requires a comparative setup, obviously. Um, yes and no. I think one, yeah. of the, one of the opportunities is not just the comparative, but also is this particular intersection or view um, supporting a neuroscientific principle as well as your intuitive and experiential principle, the philosophical framework that you I bring. mean, please help. Please, okay, I please think send me the references and, uh, and uh, I'll put my email. And we're just in starting, the so there's a lot of scope yeah, to, get, yeah. to get to get in, uh, input. Would be wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Uh, maybe one more question. Milton, you had a question. You had the first person to ask a question. Would you like to ask your question, Milton? Sure. Um, I'm interested in knowing about other form languages and whether they are consonant with your thinking. So, for example, if we talk about traditional or classical architecture, it's quite rich, but also quite distinct in vocabulary from, this, from the uh, projects that you've shown. How do you reference traditional form? You had said in your initial, one of your initial slides that you're looking for innovative ordering and framing. How do you look at traditional ordering and framing? Well, I mean, it's a base, initially it's a, it's a critique. So I have this discourse where if you look at the classical architecture, it has actually a lot of order because it uses symmetry and proportion. Uh, and, and, and over on top of that, it has certain familiar, let's say, uh, types, uh, figures. So where you, where you can have kind of top-down browsing like a basilica or as a church and so on, a palace, which have, but, but they also, so, so, so that is, makes, makes it easy to identify the object and sever it off from the next. It also is easy to understand the, the address the, um, um, the, the, the entrance, for instance, and you have certain structure always to this, you know, like the piano nobile in the center, the ground, and the, you have the detail, ornamental detail, uh, let's say overlaying that and redundantly emphasize that the rustication in the, in the lower floors and then, the, and then the, 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 the finer ornament on the piano nobile and there's a semiology there and decoration as well. And what I thought, and when you move from the Renaissance to the Baroque, it's very interesting that, that the Baroque has new means, uh, which I analyze functionally performatively as allowing for the integration of larger complexes, more parts, and maintaining a sense of unity. So if you go through a complex like, um, you know, St. Peter's, with very, very large and with various parts integrated, or even Versailles, you realize that some of the features of the Baroque, which is, for instance, one thing is deep depths of relief for distant viewing, colossal order where the columns go across three floor, uh, three or four floors, you get large, you get this kind of larger structuration you maintain even in a lot, much larger building and complex and you have you use kind of symmetry on a new level and in, let's say you have the when you cut a, a baroque building in half the each side is very asymmetric and then you flip this you get a much stronger sense of integration it's a bit like these these kind of rosha images where you have an ink spill and you flip that you get a very strong symmetry effect there's the Renaissance, each part is in itself symmetrical. So the overall is not strong, it's flat. It's, 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 so the Baroque feature, you know, depth of relief, colossal order, the use of curvature as well, the convex concave, which ties together many parts. Uh, uh, there are, let's say, for me, within a discourse of maintaining legibility effect in the, the face of increased scale and complexity with, in, in unifying this, but 
but it's still a kind of unitary simple. So everything is orders around one thing. Whereas we in the modern world, so when you have the modernism coming in and breaking away from proportion and symmetry, can break away from classic proportion because it has steel and concrete, and it also breaks away from 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 um, and it needs to do that to have there are more degrees of freedom to fit and make more higher variety of buildings and building types and fit them with each other. There's much more variety uh, of, of buildings, and but they're losing legibility and you get it becomes quite kind of illegible and difficult to distinguish one building from the other. When you look from from the side of a building, you don't know if the same building as you looked at earlier because never in in, in our architectural perception we, all, we we never get the full view it's not something in the hand we, we, we see it here and then we need to when we go around we need to write ah this is the back of that building in modernism that becomes very very difficult so so that's my discourse and i'm saying parametrism beyond modernism is actually main is actually able to increase that legibility in order and increase complexity at the same time whereas modernism actually from modernism to postmodernism into deconstructism we have ever more degrees of freedom and ever less ordering so these become highly disordered and chaotic and illegible constructions. So we have this kind of descent, descending graph from, from, from the traditional into the modernist, into the postmodernist, becomes just collage into deconstructivist, becomes even more uh, abstracted. And then you have parametrism where it goes further in each degree, you have this degrees of freedom increase, mm -hmm. But degenerating order. And we, in parameters, we decrease in we have increase of degrees of freedom further, but we are suddenly inverting the graph and we can actually increase order. Patrick, that's um, another lecture. Oh, sorry. Um, Ali had a very interesting question related to, to your work. Ali, I liked your question. Would you it's a very quick one and we have like two minutes maximum because we have the new session okay. at 10 30. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Hi, hi Patrick. Um hi. great uh, presentation. I, um I'm wondering if um, any parametric tools are used after the occupancy um, for uh, the human experience of the place. Um, you know, I'm I, because I haven't been into any of your projects. I really don't want to, you know, say it would be dizzying or anything like that. But because I think they're for, uh, they are formally very beautiful. Um, I think they function very well, uh, but have you tested at all these? Um... Well, I mean, look, the testing is uh, building these and having these occupied and we sometimes go back and we get revis we revisit, even with corporate structures, of course, with museums, we can revisit and we actually exhibit in our own museums and <laughs> several already. So you can see how that works. But uh, no, systematically, no, of course, post-occupancy studies and what we're doing in terms of these simulations, we, would, we, we should have empirical, um, um, a validation afterwards and comparing and to build up a repertoire of knowledge. I mean, a part of the methodology is actually to, to try to chart and empirically chart, let's say if we have a client who we, who we build a new building for, to go to their current premises and make, and make a kind of social research, I mean, questionnaireing, but also uh, organigram video feeds to understand interaction patterns, because there's different cultures with their slightly different behavioral patterns to and also you have a particular mix of, let's say, types of agents. So we, that's part of the methodology then to tailor the simulation model and then to try out various designs. But of course the post construct, but my vision is that we, anyway, these buildings need kind of maybe a, a, a number of refurnishing and rearrangement because we also have a lot of degrees of flexibility. And then we then kind of, kind of keep tracking and trying things and, but this can't be a blind testing. It needs the heuristics and a simulation guidance, but at the same time, this would be a validation uh, and loop, which I think is very important. So look, this is, we are architects. Architecture is kind of um, a relatively, you know, behind the curve on all of that. And we are trying to, with our kind of uh, slim resources between universities and our research department as our firm to, 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 to move forward, but we're certainly not there, but it's on our agenda. And empirical research is always, let's say, a big kind of step. But we need, of course, also help. We need scientists to, to you know, and, and universities to, to engage and help because it's well, something Patrick, I tough think for architects. With, 
I hate to interrupt, but I think uh, with our team here in our group at AMPA, we would love to help you do post-occupancy studies with the biometric wearables and go through the buildings and start to continue to work with you on that. And and I hate to cut you off because it's always <laughs> okay, so interesting well, no, to talk like, to I'm you. I'm sorry, I was, so we need I was to go as usual uh, over-ambitious is what I was trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Patrick, okay, and thank pleasure. you, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, Fred, how did you take to that? You're on mute. Fred, you're on mute. Um, what I'm thinking about is changing my worldview and realizing uh, we're approaching a population of 9 billion people and growing and that a new architecture needs to be associated with the new challenges. It's China. Most of their projects are in China. Mm -hmm. 80%, mm -hmm. he told me, 80%. Yep. Of course, it's a concern for the company itself that they're so uh, exposed in China because China is going through some changes right now. And, you know, uh, with a government that can decide to slap regulations down, suddenly what, anyway, but um, so China's very progressive and very pro on these things. Yep. Um, they've had, uh, they closed an office in North America. I'm not sure where, you know, it, it comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. But I say China because of the vast number, so many cities with so many, many people, millions of yep. people in them. Right. You know, we have small number of cities with millions of people, but my goodness. So uh, yeah. And well, these the, point, the point being, we cannot continue to build cities as we've done it. No, no. So what, what will be the change? And this is a good way in which to debate that. It is. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask him a question and I'm glad uh, others did. Um, so, I mean, his core point, I think, is that the expressive power of the parametric syntax, the parametric space, the expressive power of parametric space, obviously, is much greater than the expressive power of a more straight line space. A straight line is a special case of a curve. So there's so many curves you can have. Expressive power, yeah. more power to express. Is it comprehensible? Hence his concern with legibility. Mm -hmm. Now, you look at those pictures and you say, wow, interesting shapes and everything, but I'm not sure I want to live in there. And that's because they're all plastic. But, but so the, then you ask the question, all right, you're keenly aware that you need to use color, you need to use texture, you need to use materials. He doesn't talk, about, he mentions it, but he doesn't show us the outcome of color, texture, and materials. Now, that kind of thing is a real challenge, I think, in finding harmony, Har new harmony. When you have these things like that, how we have a, a, a history of familiarity with the use of textures and materials for the more classical designs, yeah. what do we do when we've got all these curvy things? How do you shape the, the, the shade? Is the shading supposed to be the natural shading from different perspectives or what? And all this idea about, I see it from here like this, you see it from there like this. I mean, you couldn't possibly do this without all these new, new tools, right? Couldn't mm -hmm. possibly. I, mean, I, I thought one of the best slides of all that he had was the one where, where he showed that and then you tilt it a little bit on the side and oh my goodness, they're square. they started out to be squares, they're, 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 they're round. Or, or some of the different things, all the different angles. So this concern with multiply aspected legibility. Is David, something... this is great, but shouldn't we release people for the session that starts a minute ago? <laughs> Michael, you're so practical. You're right. Absolutely. Yes. Probably look. I yeah, the next section has started. It's too bad we're not in a okay. breakout room. So uh, to, to be continued. Sure, excuse me. Yes, let's continue. All right, leaving. Leaving, me too. Bye. Um, 
I will close the meeting for everybody.